galaxy. So it hasn't been fully digested, so to speak. Um, so we're seeing its remnants, we're seeing it in the process of disruption. Um, the movie I showed you uh, is only showing the stars, but you can do these simulations and also see where the, the dark matter ends up. And um, this isn't a movie, but it's an image from one of these simulations. And uh, same thing, so it's the Sagittarius uh, merger. The stars are shown by this light gray and the dark matter by the, um, by the dark gray. So as you can see, there isn't a perfect one-to-one -one correspondence between the two, but overall, the dark matter seems to trace roughly what the stars are doing in this case. Um, now, this, these, these examples of streams are probably one of the most spectacular examples of mergers because we can see them, right? It's very intuitive. We actually can make out the orbits of these objects. Um, and uh, there's a lot of these streams that are actually known, um, and there's a lot of promise in the next few years to discover more of these. So this is a very active area of research. Um, however, there's another class of structure that can get left behind that visually is not quite as stunning, um, but is, is quite important. Um, and this is the kind of structure that gets left behind when a satellite galaxy has made many more of these orbits. So um, these tend to be older mergers. They've, uh, the satellite galaxy has sort of fallen in. It's gotten disrupted. A lot of more material has come out. But because it's completed many more of these orbits, all of its stuff gets spread out spatially. So we can no longer make out the very beautiful paths that we could for the streams. Um, however, energy is conserved in this process. And so what that ends up meaning is that we actually end up still seeing really interesting features in velocity space, even if all of the material is sort of spread out. Um, we can see this in simulations. So um, this is uh, some work from a few years ago in 2011 um, where we were looking at uh, a dark matter only simulation. And if we look at dark matter particles that spatially look like this, um, when we look at them in velocity space, we actually see these interesting patterns. Like there's these you know, interesting lobes here in radial velocity and tangential velocity. So even if spatially, it, it looks really boring. Um, we can take a look at this, these kinds of events in fire. So the movie I showed you earlier. And what we find is that, again, when we look at what the dark matter and the stars are doing, um, as a function of velocity, the, both the dark matter and the stars seem to trace each other very well, even in this case. Um, so we get these interesting velocity features. We see them both in dark matter and stars. And actually, the two uh, match up quite nicely. Uh, so that was kind of a, um, that was an introduction to these, these types of merging processes that build up the Milky Way, both the halo and then also the stars that come from these, these satellite galaxies that get eaten up. Um, what I hope you've seen from these examples is that these mergers um, leave an imprint, both spatially and also in velocity structures. And these features are the ones that we can go look for uh, to try to, Un, uh, to try to sort of decipher what the Milky Way's history is. And additionally, once we do that, if we can do that with the stars, we could then use those stars as tracers for the dark matter so that they can give us hints to what the dark matter halo, um, how it's acting, what it's doing. Um, so it's a particularly opportune moment to be you know, starting on uh, research like this, primarily because of the Gaia satellite, which uh, came online in 2013. Uh, and had its second data release in April of this year. So Gaia is the follow-up astrometric survey to Hipparchos, which ran in the um, late 80s, early 90s. Um, it is very, it's very, very revolutionary in the sense that it's going to be providing measurements for over a billion stars in the Milky Way. So that's about 1% of all of the Milky Way's stars. And to put this in perspective in terms of the gain that we're going to get from Gaia versus uh, what we had from Hipparchos, um, I'm just going to show you this image here. So um, this is the galaxy, but rotated by 90 degrees. So here's, here's the Milky Way disk. Here's the center of the galaxy. And then here's the sun. This tiny little circle here around the sun was the region where Hipparchos was able to get all of its information about local stars, so measuring their velocities and distances. Uh, this 
here is what Gaia will be able to do. So a significantly larger region of the galaxy is going to get probed by the Gaia satellite and eventually we'll actually have um, good measurements uh, all the way out to here. So even going out to like uh, uh, 20 kiloparsecs or so. So um, when the second data release came out at the end of April, there were lots of data release parties. Everybody was very excited just because this was the first time that this kind of view of the Milky Way was made available. And so you know, we were congregating at these hackathons, downloading the data, trying to figure out you know, what we can do with, with all of this. Um, now, for, for dark matter, right, for the story that I was telling you earlier, what we want to do is look at the Gaia data and try to infer from it something about the history of the galaxy. How did our galaxy evolve? What were our relatives? What dragged in the dark matter that should be near the sun? Um, and that's actually, it's a challenging task because most of the stars that would come in from these kinds of mergers are really rare. So the vast majority of the stars that Gaia looks at are just in the disk of the galaxy. Um, the ones that we're interested in were not born in the disk. They were dragged in from these uh, mergers that, um, that got eaten up. And so what we need to do is essentially sift through the data to find the stars that we think are the ones that will give us the right hints. So in many ways, our task is uh, not too different from the task of a fossil hunter. Uh, so like an archaeologist would go out in the field. If they were to discover some fossil, they would use, for example, the shape of the fossil to maybe make some guesses about the creature it came from. They might you look at the fossil's environment or maybe use some radioactive dating to estimate when that creature lived. Uh, and so, you know, you would start from some fossil relic and infer something about the creature that it came from. Uh, when I first, actually when I first showed this slide, I had a more normal picture of a Tyrannosaurus rex here. Um, but my colleague pointed out to me that apparently dinosaurs have feathers. I didn't know that. And then found me this picture, uh, which I thought was actually a very nice example about how when you're making inferences like this, you know, they have to keep evolving as you, your data gets a bit better. Um, so. Uh, yeah, so essentially this task is what we need to do with the, the data from Gaia. So in this case, we're starting from the map of stars that we have from Gaia. We have to sift through it based off of things like the positions of the stars or their velocities or their chemical properties. We then are going to make some inference as to when and how those stars were dragged into our galaxy. Um, so we need to go from a map like this to a picture like this. And again, the stars that we're looking for are the minority here, so they're very rare. So we're essentially, we're just, we're going fossil hunting. Um, the, one of the key elements in going fossil hunting is actually going to be to look at the chemical abundance of the stars. So if we're going to carry this analogy one step further, um, that's essentially the equivalent of maybe doing something like radioactive dating or something like that. Because the chemical abundance of the stars actually tells us something about the time at which it came in and a property of the satellite that got eaten up. Um, so just to introduce some of the terminology that I'll be using over the course of the next few slides, um, we characterize the chemical abundance of the stars based off of uh, its metallicity, which is simply just a measure of how much metals are contained in that star. And where metals are essentially in, for everything I'm about to say, iron is representative of all metals, and hydrogen is representative of all gas. So what we're looking at is essentially the ratio of iron to the amount of iron to the amount of hydrogen in the stars. So the fewer metals, the older the star. Um, if, if that's the only thing you take away from this slide, that's the most relevant piece of information. Um, we can, uh, there's a very tight relationship that's been observed um, that links the amount of metals to the size of the galaxy. So there's a lot of information that we can get out once we can observe, once we can actually um, determine what the, uh, the metal content of the star is. So for our task, we need to make sure that any star we find originated from outside the Milky Way and was not born in, in our disk. Um, and so fortunately, there's properties um, that we can take advantage of to distinguish the two. So in particular, any star that was born outside of the Milky Way um, will, in almost all cases, it, it's not, it will be spatially distributed anywhere. It won't be preferentially located in the disk. 
Um, similarly, it will very likely not necessarily be rotating in the same direction that we know that the Milky Way disk is rotating. Um, so we can use those two things as one way of distinguishing. We can also use the fact that we know that stars that are born in the disk tend to be a lot younger than stars that were dragged in from other galaxies. So that means that they tend to be more metal rich. Um, so graphically, what this ends up looking like is if we make um, plots of, let's say, age or metallicity um, versus the circular velocity, so in the direction of the disk, um, we tend to see that the stars that came in from other satellite mergers are more metal poor, so they're older, so that's why they're located here. Um, and they have no preferred direction. They're not rotating in any particular way. <clears throat> Similarly, if we look at their behavior, uh, their distribution on and off the disk here in this direction, they're fairly isotropically distributed. In contrast, the stars that were born in the Milky Way um, will tend to be more metal rich. They're younger. That's why they're up here. They tend to be rotating with the disk, so that's why they're clumped up here. And they also tend to be located in the disk, obviously. So essentially, the goal is to try to separate out the green blobs from the blue blobs using these kinds of distributions. Um, so this is very schematic but it sort of lays the foundation for how all of this work is actually done. Um, and when the second Gaia data release came out at the end of uh, April, many groups essentially did work very similar to this. And immediately, something beautiful just fell out. And this is sort of one of those amazing things that happens when you have some big step in the, in the quality and amount of data that's sitting in front of you. Um, uh, we ended up finding our closest relative. So this is. Um, the data I'm going to show you, the results I'm going to show you, pertain specifically to looking in this region of the Milky Way, so pretty close to where the sun is. Um, and uh, the, the, the end result was that the, in work primarily by uh, Vasily Belokurov and then also followed by work by Amina Helmi and collaborators, um, they essentially identified one major galaxy that got eaten up by the Milky Way about seven billion years ago. Um, to visualize this a bit better, I'll show you a little simulation of what this uh, process must have looked like. Um, this is a top-down view of the Milky Way disk. So here's X and Y. Um, the gray dots here are all of the stars, the Milky Way stars. And I'm going to play the video. And the red blob that's going to fall in is this galaxy that got eaten up. So here it comes in. It makes several loops. And then as it starts getting closer, it just starts getting shredded into pieces, and it just dumps everything um, close here to the center part of, uh, of the, the, the disk. So let me just run that one more time. Yeah? Does what's called in the uh, radial range, does that uh, image go up back? Or is that a, a better signal? Is that a very uh, oh, this here? Oh, no, no, that's effect. That's physics. Um, yeah, yeah. So um, a lot of material gets preferentially removed from the satellite when it's uh, turning, because um, the gravitational force is going to be stronger. So you tend to accumulate stars near the turning points, and it results in what those rings that you're seeing there. Um, they're sometimes referred to as shells. Uh, yeah, so you get this kind of ringing that, that comes out there. And actually, people are now looking for those. <clears throat> so it's going to depend on the orbit of the, of the galaxy. So of the accreted. Yeah, so let's uh, see if we can eyeball it here. I mean, you could kind of see, you should, you should see that the material sort of builds up here as it loops most of the time. So like, you get those shells when it's turning. Yeah, so this particular merger, um, the, the, well, what's been inferred is that it, it came in pretty shallowly. So if here's the disk. It came in like this. It's it, on a, sort of a highly radial orbit. And so um, that's essentially the properties of that, that orbit are just setting where the shells are. So people are now actually looking for those shells pretty far, farther away to see if they can actually see the kind of accumulation of the, the stars near those points. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so this essentially now lets us go back to our family tree and uh, start breaking down breaking things down and actually, you know, we found our relative, right? So we can actually figure out where we are in, this, in these two contrasting pictures, and here's where we fall. So um, it's thought that this merger happened around redshift of 
one to three, um, so about seven, seven to 10 billion years ago. Um, this galaxy that merged in was, uh, um, had a stellar mass of roughly 10 to the seven, 10 to the eight solar mass, so pretty big. Um, and uh, you know, we can ask, you know, well, what does this mean for, you know, is our galaxy in steady state or is it not in steady state, right? Um, it, it's actually in the middle. Uh, so <laughs> if this had happened a long time before, uh, things would have been really quiet. If it had happened a lot sooner, things would have been much more of a mess. Um, we're in this middle state, so it's the best analogy I have for it is imagine that you're, you, you know, you're pouring some milk into your cup of coffee. Um, this happened roughly seven to 10 billion years ago, and things have kind of mixed up, but they haven't fully mixed. So there's still like stuff that's roiling around, but everything hasn't quite settled down yet. Um, and so this starts becoming really interesting for dark matter, right? We've had this picture of our dark matter halo as being, you know, this very boring isothermal gas in steady state for many, many years. And now with the discovery of this merger, we've identified this relative um, of the Milky Way and we can tell from the timing that it's leaving some very interesting structures and features in, um, in the galaxy. So um, we need to then, in order to really understand how to extrapolate from this to something that we could take and use and make predictions for experiments, we need to characterize um, very carefully the properties of uh, the dark matter that's coming from this, uh, from this merger. And in order to do that, we need to carefully separate out uh, the stars that we feel certain came from the merger and the stars that didn't, the stars that were born in the Milky Way galaxy. Um, this is the data we have to work with. So what I'm plotting here is um, the metal content, the metallicity, and then just the radial velocity, theta velocity, and phi velocity. Now, if you've never stared at pictures like this before, this probably just looks like a bunch of blobs. There really isn't that much like structure that might jump out at you. Um, and indeed, like with any one of the stars that's plotted in this, we don't know for sure where it came from. So we have to do a full statistical analysis to tell. Um, and uh, I won't go into the details of the likelihood study that we do, but I will show you the result. So we essentially run a clustering algorithm on this, and it allows us to break this down into three components. Um, the green here are the stars that belong to the Milky Way disk. The blue are the stars that we believe came in from this merger, and the pink are the stars that we believe are much older, so the ones that came in um, very, very early on in the galaxy. Um, so if we were to look at this in the one-dimensional projection, um, this is essentially a story of three populations. Um, here's just uh, radial velocity, theta, phi, and metallicity. The gray histograms are the, uh, it's just the data, and then the, the colored lines are the fits. So let's take a look at each one of those individually. So the green here are the most metal rich, so the youngest of those stars. Um, if you notice here, they are rotating. They have a, they're rotating at 200 kilometers a second, so they're rotating with the disk. So the green here are just stars that were born in the Milky Way and are just moving along in the disk. <clears throat> the red, are the ones that are most metal poor. So those are the oldest stars. Um, and if you look in each of these velocity panels, they're essentially isotropic. So there really isn't a lot of interesting features there. That's the stuff that we think got brought in very, very early on. And then the last one is sort of intermediate in age. Uh, and what's particularly distinctive of this is its radial velocity distribution has two bumps in it. Um, and in, in sort of this line of work, everything is kind of Gaussian, so you see something with two bumps and it looks really weird. Um, that's what tells you that there's something interesting going on. Um, uh, and so it's this particular thing with two bumps that's the, uh, the merger, the, the closest relative. What the two bumps tell you, that's all of the stars that got torn off as this galaxy was falling in towards the center of the galaxy and then as it was flying back out. So if this is, a, you know, this is a schematic picture of this orbit, essentially this is all of the stuff that got pulled off as the galaxy was moving in and then, and then moving out. So we're seeing 
the details of that orbital of that orbit reflected in the velocities of those stars. So we can actually infer something very interesting about what this galaxy was doing as a function of time before it got completely eaten up. Uh, so now to put it all together and to start making some predictions for uh, dark matter experiments. Um, what we find from our analysis is that there's these two separate components to the, the local uh, stars. Uh, we have a component that's very old. So these are the sort of the, the stars that formed when the, the proto galaxy was being put together. That comprises about 40% of all of the stars near the sun. Uh, the remaining 60%, which is the vast majority, are the stars that came in um, from our new relative that we've identified. Um, from the work that we've done with simulations, which is what I was showing you at the beginning of the talk, that gives us confidence that we can infer from these distributions that the dark matter from either of these components is essentially acting in the same way as the stellar contributions. Um, the one remaining question, though, is the relative fraction of the two. And um, characterizing that is a little tricky because the amount of dark matter that's brought in by the galaxies is not necessarily equivalent to the relative amount of stars brought in. Um, and uh, that's essentially coming from our understanding of all of the little dwarf galaxies that are orbiting around the Milky Way today. Um, we see that stars, uh, galaxies that might have the same stellar content could have very different amounts of dark matter. So we need to be able to make some inferences on um, how much dark matter is associated with the galaxies that merged. Um, we've gone through that process. We're finishing up that work now. I'll just give you the final answer. So um, this recent relative that merged, we think brought in about 25% as much dark matter as the oldest mergers that built up the halo. So it's a, it's a significant fraction of uh, what's near the sun. And so it's something that, that needs to be accounted for when we make predictions and understand uh, implications for experiments. So we have here, let me just show you some, um, it's okay, the, uh, the implications for uh, some direct detection experiments. Um, so here on the left panel, I'm showing um, the speeds of these dark matter particles in the frame of the sun. The uh, red dashed line is the distribution coming from the really old halo uh, stars. The blue is the contribution that's coming from this new substructure that we now know exists. And this black is the uh, total, adding the two together, where that gray band is the uncertainty based on the uncertainty in, in our estimate of how much dark matter is getting brought in by either component. Um, so one of the things that I find really exciting about this is we went from thinking that we would have no idea about what the local dark matter is doing to suddenly having a line with error bars on it. Um, that was something that we just didn't have before. Um, and just as a point of comparison, the really simple model that's been around for you know, um, 30 years or so is shown by the dashed uh, gray here. Uh, so that's the, the standard halo model that's, that's existed. And so you can see that the two are actually not too dissimilar, um, but they do have differences out here um, near the tail of the distribution. And, yep? Well, the previous slide you mentioned the 25% yes. number. So you're saying it's 20, no, it wouldn't be right. It's not 25% from that one event. It's you're yeah, so, it's, so if we think of it as two separate contributions, one coming from the really old mergers and then one coming from the new mergers, the um, old mergers, on average, have about, uh, a, if we take the ratio of the dark matter to the stars in each of those galaxies, about a fact, it's about 1,000. Um, if we then look at the young mergers, the, ra the ratio of the dark matter to stars is about 25% smaller. Yeah, so that's what's giving us this, uh, this, this fraction. Um, so in this, this is the actual model that we use for this. So this is. Um, the, the metallicity of the stars that we observe here. And this is just the mass to light ratio, or the amount of dark matter to stars in each of those galaxies. So for the substructure, we know its metallicity to be right around here. So that gives us a direct prediction for its mass to light ratio, um, with some spread and error given in the model. And then for the really old things that came in, that's uh, here, uh, this line here. 
So you can see that the older things tend to bring in more dark matter. Um, that's, that's a general thing that's sort of been observed. The older the galaxies, the more dark matter dominated they tend to be. Um, and so the substructure is a bit, uh, that, that merger is a bit younger, so it brings in slightly less dark matter. But the relative ratio between the two is about 25%. Yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, okay, so let's see. So, so that's the, the distributions in the solar frame. And then if we make the, um, uh, this is actually making a plot of the cross section, the dark matter nuclear cross section as a function of mass. Uh, this is assuming a xenon target. It's very simple uh, assumptions about uh, the experimental setup. Um, but this was just meant as an illustration of the impact of using this um, sort of empirically determined distribution relative to the standard assumption. So the, um, the empirical distribution is the solid black. Again, the error bars are shown by the shaded gray. And the standard halo model is shown here by the dashed gray. <clears throat> So there's a couple comments I wanted to make about this. Um, this is assuming one kind of dark matter nuclear interaction. Um, and where the differences are occurring here is where there happens to be um, some debate between results, uh, positive results in some experiments and negative results in others. So um, getting the distribution and get understanding this limits in this region is actually quite important. Secondly, I'm only showing the results for one particular kind of dark matter nuclear interaction. There's other interactions where I think this effect can actually, the impact of this can actually be larger, but we haven't worked that out yet. Um, additionally, this is gonna be really important for directional dark matter searches, because now we'd see that the dark matter is not isotropic, it has these preferred directions from um, coming from the, the radial behavior of this, of this merger. <clears throat> yeah, so, so we haven't, we can't constrain the local dark matter density. Yeah, so this is, I mean, this is essentially rho times sigma naught or something like that. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Um, yeah, yeah. So the, the array, it's a function of the density and the external velocity. Yes. Yeah. So if the error in the density is not in proportion to the sample itself. Yeah. So, so the error that's here, the, the, chain, the change that's here, that's coming purely from the difference in the, the velocity distribution. Because um, we make these two lines assuming that the local density is exactly the same between the two as a point of comparison. Okay, but if I think of 10% error. Yeah, if you think of 10% error, it's gonna shift all of these lines up and down by the same amount, but it won't change their shape. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, because essentially this is a limit on, um, this is a limit here on the local dark matter density times the cross section. So, yeah, so this is really rho, rho sigma. Yeah, it's just, it's usually just written, it's usually just written like that. But that error just gets absorbed in this quantity on the y-axis. Yeah, so that's actually the way um, it had always sort of been assumed that we'd learn about the, the dark matter velocity. It was, we're gonna, we're gonna do the experiments, we're gonna get a you know, magnificent signal, and then we'll be able to infer from there, we're able to do galactic astronomy, right? We can infer its velocity and dark matter, uh, its velocity distribution and density. Um, but, you know, so the way it's played out is sort of we haven't seen things, and we have, or in some cases we've seen it in some experiments but not in others, and then it always ends up kind of coming back to this velocity question. Like, because if you make different assumptions here, you can make things work, or sometimes you can, things are still inconsistent. And so that's what sort of motivated the desire to try to figure out a way at getting at that dark matter distribution independent of this, so that we could use this as an input 
in interpreting the experiments rather than the other way around. Although ideally, right, you would do it both ways. So you know, we'd, we'd have some prediction that's in German, determined, let's say, from Gaia. You'd have, amazingly, a detection in an experiment. And then you'd want to make sure that the two are self-consistent. Yeah. Um, great. So with that, I was just going to conclude um, by going back to where we started. Um, so remember that our, the whole story of trying to characterize the dark matter halo near the sun started with measurements of the rotation curve. Version 1.0 uh, of all of this was uh, inferring that the dark matter halo was a very simple isothermal gas. Um, this has been predictive. Um, it's guided us for, for many decades. But now with data from Gaia, we can go back and revisit that. And indeed, the story, version 2.0, is a lot more interesting, right? Because with Gaia now, we can actually start saying things about how the Milky Way formed. Um, we have discovered uh, our closest relative. In, in the galaxy uh, that dumped most of the dark matter near us. We can see it's left lots of signatures in the, the, the distribution of stars near us. Um, from work with simulations, we can see that the dark matter and stars from these kinds of mergers should actually trace each other very nicely. And then that lets us make inferences to build an, an empirical halo model. So I like calling this version 2.0 mainly because I don't think it's the last version. We still have, there's still open questions that need to be addressed and that's what we're working on next. But this is already um, a step forward from what we had and uh, I think will be, you know, helps uh, shed some light, helps us interpret results from, from experiments and also make predictions for, for some of the future experiments. Uh, it, it sort of all feeds into that. Um, so with that, um, I'll just end by um, acknowledging the postdocs, graduate students, and uh, undergrads that really played a, a critical role in, in this work. Um, most of the, the projects that I mentioned um, were really uh, led by, by Lina Nassib here. Um, and then also uh, Jonah herzogar beitman who was involved in many of the initial stages, who was an undergrad uh, at, uh, at Princeton. Um, so with that, I'm happy to take any additional questions that, that may be left. Thank you. Thanks for a very nice talk. So I have a question on this uh, sort of uh, dark matter uh, the halo 2.0. You show the nearest neighbor as spiral uh, galaxy. Can you actually prove that it was a spiral galaxy? And do you know roughly the inclination angle, the collision uh, uh, direction? Uh, is it possible to figure out where it comes from, came from? Uh, yeah. Um, oh, I, I took that slide out. Um, so we, we don't know if it was a spiral galaxy, because at this point, it's been completely disrupted. So uh, whatever was the progenitor of all of this is no longer, no longer exists. Um, so that we can Huh? What about the metallicity? Oh, the metallicity, yeah. So the metallicity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here, I could, I could tell you that. Um, so the metallicity here is uh, roughly negative 1.4 on average. And if you want to just put that in the context of dwarf galaxies that we know about, um, this is a, a figure here that's plotting the, the known dwarfs in the local group. Um, this particular galaxy that we think is disrupted is at negative 1.4. So it falls here. So fairly massive relative to the ones that we know exist today. Um, so, yeah, I'm mean, not just putting it a bit in context. Uh, we can infer the properties of its orbit based off of the velocities. So, in particular, the velocity distribution is, um, is very radial, which you can see here, because this is radial uh, theta and phi. And if you look at the blue, which is the stuff that came from this merger, uh, it's, uh, it's extended radially much more. It's, the, the dispersion in the radial direction is much greater than. It was almost in plane, yeah. It mostly came in like, like this. Um, and there's been further work uh, that's been done sort of looking um, a bit further out to see just how far out you can see the material that came from it. And it looks like it goes out to 20 or 30 kiloparsecs. So it's uh, uh, So I, I was just wondering, uh, since this happens to our galaxy, yeah. presumably it's a rather um, uh, frequent event in general. Wouldn't, in general, you expect that, uh, you know, the collision angle is random, so wouldn't the, these collisions and mergers, in general, uh, smear out the spiral galaxy in something more spherical? Because if you have something going perpendicular to the plane, you probably would 
change the... Uh, oh, you mean if we had something else that came in like this? Yeah. No, I mean, it comes from random direction, I yeah, think, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so we were lucky not to disturb kind of the disk structure, but most of the other galaxies are not so lucky. Wouldn't you see that you have more spherical galaxies because of mergers or uh, eccentricity of the galaxy would change because of the mergers? Um, yeah, so it depends on the time of which when the, and so like the relative size of the merger and the galaxy that, that it came in. So, um, uh, yeah, so I think it's a little bit hard to make general statements, but yeah, it, it should, it should, if you had it, for example, come in like this, it would definitely, it should change the, uh, the overall, like the, the density. It also depends the relative amount of dark matter that got dumped in each of that merger. So there's a lot of things it depends on, but um, essentially, yes, it, it, it could potentially affect the, the potential, the gravitational potential of the galaxy. Does that answer the question? So in the sense that I would really ignore if you say some survey, which is what I would work for. Oh, you want to like survey a bunch of galaxies? Yeah, so the challenge is that um, you need to have a, a large enough census of stars in each of those galaxies to be able to pick out this structure and then infer something about the, the history of that galaxy. Um, and that, that's challenging. I mean, I think people can do that for like Andromeda and some of the closer neighbors and people have been studying things like streams in, in some of these other galaxies. And, and with Gaia, you might be able to also get something like that and build up the history of the, the brightest galaxies nearby, but I think doing that broadly over many of the galaxies, we just don't have like enough stars to really be able to infer that. So I, I know you said you didn't want to go into the details of the likelihood analysis, but I wanted to ask you just a question. If the smoking gun signature for this galaxy is this bimodal radio mm -hmm. velocity distribution, how naturally is that falling out of the data? Are these like everything else is fit with a Gaussian and this is fit with a double peaked? Yeah. Or are those so just, you have so much data, those histograms are super smooth and they just look beautiful. Uh, I could show you the likelihood functions. Um, <clears throat> so what we do is we uh, assume that uh, the disk and the halo are modeled as Gaussians. Um, and for this substructure piece, uh, we we model it as the sum of two Gaussians, but we give the analysis enough freedom that those two Gaussians can merge to be one. So we let, we let it sort of swing. So um, we do a full Bayesian scan. So we do an MCMC analysis and we scan over all of the parameters there. So essentially the analysis is tests whether or not you prefer a single Gaussian versus oh, okay. two. Okay, so, so you have an evidence value that two Gaussians is the preferred model. That's right, that's right. Um, in the very beginning, you had a slide um, showing um, the four ways you were assuming that dark matter behaved. Um, I know that it was solid state, uh, one over. Oh yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Where uh, where did that come from? Is that just uh, was that previous research, or is that um, yeah, that's it right there, steady state. That's what it was. Mm -hmm. um, where did that come from? Um. It's yeah. Were those <laughs> assumptions? Question. Were those uh, assumptions you made? And, and no, so, so they weren't assumptions I made. So these are um, essentially the 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 standard papers, uh, like the the initial papers on this are, are listed here. Um, yeah. So these were um, like so in the original work, it was um, it, they're actually really fascinating to go back and, and read through. But they're sort of set up as we see a flat rotation curve. We need to make some assumption about what the dark matter halo is doing. Um, these are. These seem simple and reasonable assumptions to start with, and so we're going to start with these. Um, and it's just kind of amazing that it's sort of it's, it's held up for so long, but now we can kind of revisit that now that there's better data. So, any other questions? Okay, I have one. <laughs> Yeah, we're just starting on this, so this is um, <clears throat> uh, not fully formed thoughts. But the the idea is, so we take the, um, I like breaking it down in my head in terms of we have all of the local dark matter, and then we could break it down the part that's coming from luminous and the part that's coming from dark. Um, at this point, 
I think we're starting to get a good handle on this. And right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm talking, yeah, smooth, smooth dark matter. I don't mean um, uh, clumps. I, I, I don't mean. Yeah, what I meant was disrupted dark subhalos. Yes, yes. Um, so I mean like disrupted luminous galaxies and disrupted dark subhalos. Um, and so yeah, so where you know the the material that was removed from the disruption of either is contributing to the smooth dark matter that's near us. Um, and so what we're trying to figure out now is whether or not Given that we know this, if we have a good estimate on the total amount of local dark matter from the dynamics, if we subtract the two, whether or not that'll give us some indication of how much stuff came there from the disrupted dark subhalos. Um, and uh, if it does, then it could potentially actually maybe tell us something about like the, the mass profile of these, not, not the, um, like the, the, the subhalo mass distribution. I don't know though. We, we certainly haven't gone to that. We're just we're still at the initial stages, tr just trying to figure out whether or not uh, we can do this kind of subtraction process to to pull this out. We're trying it out in simulations first, where we know what the answer is. Yeah. 